Um, I think I'm going to read, so because it's a multiple narrator, I think I'm going to read a bit from the much-hated mother and then a bit from Max himself. So this is um, around the beginning of the book. And uh, the mum's called Karen. I actually think she's quite nice. But, uh, <laughs> here we go. <clears throat> it's this time of the morning, just before dawn, that I love the most. It's the quiet. I didn't used to notice it when I was a child or at college. Now these minutes are the only ones during my day that are not full of noise. It's funny what we miss about being young. But I miss the proliferation of silence unfolding before me on a long Sunday afternoon. I remember in our first house in Hemingway near Oxford, slipping downstairs for a glass of water and looking out the bay window as the sun moved across the garden, or sitting propped up against my pillows in bed, still in the silent waking of the morning just before the bird song began and woke Max up. I remember the silences in the apartment we used to have just after college, in the early days of my pregnancy, my bare-chested new husband reading next to me while I read cheesy crime dramas and thrillers, my guilty pleasure, enjoying the peace before I started my daily ritual of throwing up and aching. I try to imagine Steve, my husband, that young, that skinny. Imagine Steve as a lanky boy in those old ripped jeans with no hair on his chest. But I can't quite do it. I rub, off my, I rub my head to stave off the slight hangover I feel brewing from last night's dinner party. Life turned out differently from what I had predicted. I do understand what my mother meant now, that you give up things for your children's sake. And perhaps there are lines that I wouldn't be able to cross in terms of sacrifice, but I haven't reached them yet, and I hope I don't. I wanted my family to be close, like my childhood family never was. And it is. I'm not always the best parent, but I try very, very hard. What is different about life as it is now and the life I dreamed about is how I had imagined it. I had no idea when I was younger about what love is, what it does, how it moves, how it grows, what it feels like, why you value it. How I feel about my children in particular is different from how I imagined it felt to have children. I don't think I had actually thought it through. I did not understand that my body and soul were about to be entirely claimed that I would feel physical pain when I heard them crying, and that I would love them beyond all reason, even when they were being terrible. I'll admit that I wasn't ready. Being a parent means having to make choices rather than meander about options. It means having to live the way you wanted to live, but could never be bothered to before, advocating for things you never used to consider, boundaries, rules and plans. It means living in a school catchment district and saving for university, it means constriction in your chest and worry all the time, and if not all the time, at least once a day. It means feeling responsible for the every move of two autonomous beings that I cannot control. Particularly now that they are older. I keep waiting for something to happen. Something to come in and crush us all. That's Karen. Um, so I hate to interrupt you. I think we have two minutes. Do you think you can This do is it? exactly two minutes long. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I timed it earlier. <laughs> okay, so this is um, Max and um, something we meet Max and we think he's a boy at first and then uh, but very early on, so I'm not giving anything away, he walks downstairs and he talks about um, being in sex. So this is at night. I walk beneath the stairs to the kitchen door, push it open, reach to the wall on my left and turn on the light. My ghostly reflection appears in the window over the sink. My face is soft-jawed for a boy, but not too much. Not remarkably. Maybe I just notice it because that's what the doctors told me the last time we saw them, that I am soft-jawed for a boy. There is no facial hair there, not even any sprouting. My nose is small to medium, my eyes are a light green-blue. I used to have a lot of freckles as a kid, and now I just have a few on the tops of my cheeks. My eyelashes are quite long, but there is really no reason right now for anyone to suspect that I'm anything other than a teenage boy. But wait until my facial hair doesn't grow. Wait until I don't look any manlier. Wait until all the other guys in my year become men, and I stay smooth-chinned, underdeveloped, androgynous wait a year. 
I never think about these things, but now I'm thinking about them. Touching my chin, peering closely at the pores of the other me. My hair's blonde, the yellow blonde colour of a newborn chick and slightly fluffy. It hangs down from a side, side parting. The hair at the back of my neck is cut closer. I like how the other me looks. I mean, I know there's a clock ticking. I don't know what will happen after I reach 18, but we didn't know what would happen after 13 and we got through that. Mum and Dad have always been okay about it. We don't talk about it much, but I've never been made to feel that it was a huge deal. I mean, I know it is, I guess. The other me touches the back of his hair, where lying on a pillow has fluffed it up and tangled it. The other me looks relaxed. The other me looks like he did yesterday. But the first me, the flesh and blood me, feels weird. I'm hollow. I'm blank. I'm going through the motions of walking and getting and swallowing and rinsing the glass and putting it on the sideboard, but I am just not here. I can't be, because any sane person would be freaking out, and I don't feel much right now. I've gone into survival mode. I'm tired and shaky, and I know if I'm not a blank, if I allow myself to feel, I'll shake and shake and shake until my legs give away. Well, thank you. Don't walk. Oh.